They gave me Vicodin after my knee surgery. They kept prescribing it, so I kept taking it. I didn't know it would be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. program dedicated to educating you about how our justice system works and the people behind it. In this episode, we will talk with Ohio 8th District Court of Appeals Judge and former Cleveland Municipal Court Judge Larry A. Jones. Judge Jones, welcome to the program. Good afternoon, Judge. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward for our talk this afternoon. Oh, thank you, thank you, and so am I. Uh, how's your summer been, by the way? Uh, it's been a good summer, very warm, uh, staying busy. Took a couple weeks of uh, vacation, uh, but I'm working very hard. Okay, okay, and, and you're at the Court of Appeals now. Yes. Um, do you miss being over across the street, Cleveland Municipal Court? Well. Truthfully, I, I miss the people. We had a lot of great people over there, the employees, uh, the staff. Uh, but I don't miss the 100 cases a day, and I've served on Cleveland's court for 21 years. So <laughs> it was time for me to get a promotion <laughs> and, and count my blessings. But great court, great people. So I miss the people. Uh, but that's about it. I'm, I enjoy my job. I have, have the best job in America. <laughs> <laughs> court of Appeals judges. You know, a lot of people say they would love to be a Court of Appeals judge. Um, you're a native Clevelander? Well, really, I was born in the, the state of Georgia. I was born in a little town called uh, Valdosta, Georgia. And my family moved up here. I was probably maybe four or five years old. I've been a Clevelander ever since. So I was part of the 50, you know, during the 50s and 60s was a great migration from the South where, you know, a lot of African Americans moved North with the hope of improving themselves, employment. And my dad brought us to Cleveland. So wasn't born in Cleveland, but I'm a Clevelander now. Okay, part of the great migration. Have you had a chance to read the book about the great migration? Um, hmm, I can't think of the name of the book. It'll come to me in a minute. Uh, now. You went to high school here in Cleveland? Went to high school. I went to uh, the best high school in the city of Cleveland, uh, Glenville, Glenville Tarbell. <laughs> uh, I was very fortunate. And, you know, during those days, we had some good teachers, and you have a very nurturing environment. So I went to Glenville High School, uh, Patrick Henry Junior High, and then I went away to college, to College of Worcester. <clears throat> and I majored in uh, political science, uh, graduated from uh, college and I went, came back to Cleveland and attended law school, Case Western Reserve Law School. Okay. Why did you choose Case Western? Well, you know, I was coming back to Cleveland. Uh, it was a good school uh, and quite frankly, I, I got accepted. You know, law school was very uh, competitive and I applied to several law schools and there was one of the first law schools that accepted me. So, you know, I told them yes, worked out the financial deals and uh, with the case. Okay, what was your undergrad major? Uh, political science. I always kind of be very active in politics and, you know, I think I was like the president of our uh, student government when I was in high school and college and during my law school days I was like uh, co-chair of Black Student Law, so law Student Association. Okay. So I mean I always am involved in our community and where I'm at, I think a person should be involved. Good, good. Now, before you got on the Cleveland Municipal Court, what were you doing in Cleveland? Well, uh, I graduated from law school, and uh, my first job was with the county prosecutor's office. I was assistant county prosecutor. And I did that for probably about four years. And I ran for Cleveland City Council. I got let, let me ask. Who was the county prosecutor when you got hired? Uh, John T. Corrigan. Okay, so yeah. you work for John T. Corrigan. I work with John T. Corrigan. Okay. Uh, uh, back, and it was a great experience because as a county prosecutor, 
you know, you show up for work, right out of law school, they gave you a file, they point you in the direction of the courtroom, and you went in the courtroom and you tried cases. And I think during my uh, legal career, that was very beneficial for me because I got to try cases, all type of cases, from you know simple assaults to murder cases. But it gave me a, a sense of confidence in a courtroom, and you know no one really could intimidate you. Well, we got to go to trial. Well, if we got to go to trial, let's call twelve people up and go to trial. <laughs> Do you remember how many tr jury trials you had as a county prosecutor? Probably within those four years, probably I would say maybe 30 to 40 jury trials. Where some people in a whole lifetime don't yeah, um, yeah. have that many jury trials. Yeah, so you, you've got some good experience. If I had more jury trials as an assistant county prosecutor than I did as a Cleveland Municipal Court judge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting statistic. Um, all right, so you worked for the county for how many years? For four years. Okay. and. and were you involved in the community during those four years? Uh, yes, I was. I, you know, I, I lived in Galimbio. Uh, at that time, it was Ward 27. So you used to have different area, what they call area councils back in the day. So I was involved in uh, area council, involved in my church, <clears throat> which at the time was uh, Everlasting Baptist Church okay. on the corner of uh, St. Clair and 80 Road. And that's, that's where my roots at. And I always like to always been involved. I encourage young, young folks to be involved in the community, so involved. And I knew at some point in time I would probably enter the political process. Okay. Well, let me ask, what made you go to law school? Well, uh, I remember we had some good teachers at Glenview. I remember one teacher, uh, Dennis Didell. He, uh, he taught us history and black history, and he was an attorney. And so, having this feeling that if somebody gonna make decisions about your life, you should be part of that process. And I felt, well, if people are making decisions about my life, then I wanna be part of that process. And as I looked around, uh, law school was a good avenue. And, but a little side joke, when I first went to college, you know, I wanted to be a doctor. You know, I was gonna be a doctor and make a whole bunch of money. And i never forget it was like, uh, spring quarter of my freshman year. I'm in my room studying um, chemistry, organic chemistry. And I look out the dorm window and you know, my friends out there throwing frisbees and footballs and whatever. So I think I dropped chemistry the next week and uh, turned to political science. So, <laughs> so much for the medical yeah. profession. But you know, again, I was very fortunate. Um, Judge Solomon Oliver, who's the chief uh, judge in our district, federal judge, uh, was a teacher there. You know, Judge Oliver was a student at um, College of Worcester. Okay. He graduated, went to law school, and he came back. He taught at the college probably about four, maybe five or six years. And I had the opportunity to take several classes from him, and he used what we call the casebook method, same method they use in law school. And with, with his help and support, I became very interested in law. And uh, in fact, he was very instrumental to help me get in law school. Good, good. Are you still good friends with Absolutely. Judge Oliver? Absolutely. He's, he's one of my mentors, friends, and uh, I love him dearly. Okay, okay. Well, good, good. Tell him I said hi when you see him okay. again. Um, now, you're, you're working at the county prosecutor's office, you're involved in stuff in the neighborhood. You ran for city council at some point in time. Right. I ran uh, the first time. I ran, I lost about 300 votes. Uh, I ran against uh, a, a good person uh, by the name of Caesar Moss. In fact, my parents was involved in politics and they helped put Caesar in, into the office. But I always knew that at some point I wanted to run for office. And uh, again, my philosophy is I can do just as good, if not better than anybody else. But I lost about 300 votes. And then Caesar, he turned around, he resigned. And then next two years, I got elected to uh, Ward 27. Okay, that was Collinwood? Collinwood. Okay. And eventually became Ward 10. Okay. They, they reduced the size of, uh, of council. And it's been reduced again. Yes. <laughs> okay. How did you enjoy city council? Well, it was a great experience. And uh, we wouldn't be sitting here today. I wouldn't be talking to you as a judge, but for that experience. You know, it got me into the ground level of uh, politics. It gave me a good sense of what's happening in our community. 
And it really gave me a, a good feeling of working for people and being a public servant. You know, if you're a Cleveland City Council person, you know, you get up probably 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, your, your telephone call, start calling till you go to bed. I mean, you're a former councilman, so you know that. I know. But I know. It, it gives you a, a good sense of, you know, what our government should be about. And at the same time, it gave me a chance to meet other colleagues, other councilmen from east side or west side. And it was very instrumental when I decided to run for judge that my colleagues supported me. Good, good. Um, who was on council with you at that time? Uh, well, you know, George Forbes was there. He was the <laughs> president of council. You know, I learned a great deal uh, from George. And um, I was, when I first got elected, I didn't know anything. So I was, became part of the school to uh, get rid of George, and it didn't go anywhere. But, you know, I've learned a lot from George, and I just watched the way George used to conduct hearings. And when somebody came to city council when a committee meeting, George always gave you a sense that you're getting a fair shot and he listened to you. And those are one of the things I took away as a judge. You know, when somebody comes in front of me, whether I decide that they're going to be guilty or innocent or even on the court of appeals, I give them my full attention and so they can feel that, hey, I got a fair shot at it. The judge heard me. Okay, okay. And, and I imagine there were a whole lot of lessons from city council. Oh, no, gathered. no question. Uh, you know, uh, I was there with uh, Lonnie Burton. You know, I could just go down the list. Uh, former Mayor Michael White, uh, you know, Tyrone Bowden, Earl oh, Turner, yeah. Rikakis, Polensic, you know. Uh, okay. So okay. We, and we had fun. It was, it was a good time in my life. We had fun and you felt that you was making a difference in our community. Now, you were on city council, you ran from, for judge while you were a member of city council. Yes. Um, did you learn anything from that experience that, that you took to the bench with you afterwards? Well, you know, I think just a sense of being a public servant, servant and being good to folks. If you, if you can help somebody out, try help them out. And that was the one approach I took to uh, Cleveland Supreme Court. Because basically, Cleveland Supreme Court, it's a people court. You know, you hear traffic cases, misdemeanors, and people in, who appear in front of you, you have a chance to hopefully shape their lives and help them. More so on a common, I mean, a municipal level than a common pleas level. So a lot of times, once you get to the common pleas level, it's, you know, the die is cast. It's tough to change people. So that's why I basically brought from uh, Cleveland City Council, the whole issue of if you're down there, try to do, do some good and, and help folks in their lives. Okay, okay. Well, let's talk about Cleveland Municipal Court. Uh, some people call it the People's Court. And uh, 100 cases a day some days. Um, there were some programs instituted while you were a judge. Uh, could you tell us about, for example, drug court? How did, how did drug court get started? Okay. Well, before I answer that, you know, one of the things I'm very proud of my experience at Cleveland Municipal Court, uh, I had the opportunity to be the presiding minister, a presiding administrative judge for probably about 14 of the 21 years I was there. And one of the things we try to do at our court is be responsive to the community. So in 1998, uh, the late Stephanie Tubbs Jones had received a federal grant to start a countywide drug court program. But the judges in the Common Pleas Court uh, thought it was a liberal social program and they voted to not accept the fund. So at that point in time, uh, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, along with our court and myself, decided, well, can we bring the court the funds to Cleveland's court? And we was able to transfer the funds from the Common Pleas Court to our court, and we started a drug court program. And when we first started, uh, no one really knew what it was about. Uh, everybody thought it was some social program. So we had to go out in the community. I mean, myself and our staff, we would go out to the community, talk to folks, and just let them know what drug court is about. And basically, it's a, it's a treatment program. And, you know, I like to say we laid the groundwork now today we have a countywide uh, drug court program. The municipalities have drug court program, and drug treatment works. You know, so hopefully over the last 20 years we have seen an education process of our community about drugs and treatment of drugs. And I used to always like to point out, it calls 
between twenty-five and thirty thousand dollars to house a person in prison, versus cost maybe two to three thousand to give a person drug treatment for a year. So you can look at those numbers, and and uh, we can make a difference in that area. Okay. Um, so the drug court got started. Uh, the county judges voted it down. Did the county court, county judges ever get drug court started with them? Well, I think probably before I left, I left uh, Cleveland's court in 2008. Uh, the next year, they started a uh, countywide uh, drug court program. You know, and that's one of the things that as a judge, I think we need to be more proactive. And a lot of times we have a mentality as judges to, you know, lock them up and throw the keys away. And, but when it comes to drugs, that's really on solve the problem. If you lock someone up and there's no type of uh, intervention or treatment, they come out and in many cases worse addict than they went to uh, prison. So, I mean, hopefully we have kind of turned that corner. And it's kind of interesting, you know, our country now finally see that, wait a minute, you know, especially with the opening uh, epidemic, yeah, people are seeing, well, I don't mind grandson, I don't mind daughter to go to jail because of they, you know, taking these pills. So uh, hopefully we can start being a more educated uh, community and really place more emphasis and priority on drug treatment. Oh, I, I, I agree that treatment's essential. Um, I, I um, had a buddy get out of jail recently who I had known since junior high school, and I saw him and um, I asked him if he had gotten treatment while he was in jail for seven years. And he said, no, there was no treatment whatsoever. So I asked him if he was gonna leave it alone and he said yes, but less than two months later, he had died of an overdose. Yeah. He not getting treatment while being incarcerated, just yeah. like you it, said, less people out and they're it, still junkies. It, it needs to be focused upon and, you know, we used to talk about the military industrial complex. Now we got a prison industrial complex. You know, we build more prisons than any other country uh, in the world. We send our folks to prison. And it's very interesting. Stay of Ohio, you used to go to prison, and you could apply yourself. You could come out with a associate's degree. You come out with a BA. And sometimes you come out with a, a master degree. They got rid of all that. And it doesn't make any sense. So we basically warehouse people and think when they get out, they gonna ch change and change their lives around, and that's not the case. So again, that's my role, and I think role of judiciary. You know, try to make some common sense of what's going on here, mm -hmm. and pass the words along to the legislators because they really have the power. Do, do, in your capacity as a court of appeals judge, do you get a chance to lobby the state legislatures about certain things going on in the court system? <sighs> not really. You know, a lot of times we try to do that through our opinions, you know, uh, they call dicta, you know, we might put a little dicta in the, our opinion that, you know, something needs to be done about this or a state legislator needs to think about changing the laws or something like that. Okay. Uh, well, glad to hear you're doing that. Glad to hear you're doing that. All right. Well, there's some other programs that got started while you were a judge in Cleveland Municipal Court. We, we call them specialty docket programs. You want to talk about yeah. some of those? Yeah. And again, you know, I used to tell my colleagues, if you have a program you think is going to be beneficial, bring it forth and we go with it. Uh, we're very known for our domestic violence uh, special doctor. You know, Judge Ryan Adrian, who retired last year, is a renowned expert in the whole area of domestic violence. And he started a domestic violence uh, docket and it's still going on. Uh, we had a mental health docket. You know, unfortunately, Back in the late 70s and early 80s, they closed all the mental health facilities. So as a result, you know, the jails and the courts become the new mental health uh, facilities. So we developed a mental health uh, docket, and I believe it's still, it's in, still uh, going. It's still, still going. Uh, and uh, another problem we used to have is people driving without a license. Driving without a license or driving license on suspension. So I believe it was Judge Gallagher came up us and let's do something to help people drive because we have a lot of folks who are gainfully employed and they don't have a license so i think the tip program uh was a traffic intervention traffic, yeah traffic intervention, intervention program. program tip and again it started to help people 
work the system so they could get a valid driver's license and wouldn't get caught up in, in a maze. And it really amazed me, uh, our bureau, more vehicles, uh, with these reinstatement fees. It's just totally out ridiculous. And, you know, we had some folks who would come in front of us, maybe had, oh, four or $5,000 in reinstatement fees. There was no way in the world that person was able to get their license back. But my, from my understanding, now they have kind of changed that and they work out some type of payment plans where people can get their license. You know, it, it's rare to hear a judge publicly <laughs> criticize <laughs> the Bureau of Motor Vehicles for, for the way they put the um, reinstatement fees together. And, and uh, at a judge's meeting a couple of years ago, we, we had a strong conversation with some people from the Bureau of Motor Vehicles about that very fact. And, it's, it's starting to change. Uh, okay, cool. People can go now and get on the payment plan, $50 a month, um, get driving privileges, pay off whatever they can pay off. Um, the state legislature changed the law so people can file bankruptcy and include that in the bankruptcy. Okay. When well, you were judged, they did, couldn't do that. Not at all. Well, that, that's very good to know. And hopefully people realize that because we have a lot of people out there who still don't have license and they be dodging the police. So if there's a program available, they should really avail themselves to take care of that situation. There, there have been a couple of tragic accidents where somebody got killed, the driver didn't have a driver's license. So it's, it's always tragic. So we want the state to help people get their license. Um, but the people have a responsibility to maintain insurance, for example. And that's probably one of the biggest reasons those licenses get taken away when people don't have yes. insurance. Uh, physical responsibility insurance. Um, and another program we started, uh, we used to have town hall meetings where we actually take the judges out into the neighborhood along with the clerk of court so that people can meet the judges. And I used to say, and people don't realize how important the, the role of a judge is. A judge can decide when you come to the courthouse, you know, whether or not you're going to leave the courthouse. Uh, I can decide whether or not you, your, your property rights, uh, they decide in many cases where you're going to live and die. And a lot of times we vote for judges, we have no idea who the judges are, no idea who, what type of policies there are. So we started this program, we actually took the judges out in a different neighborhood throughout the city of Cleveland. So we actually meet the judges, tell them about various programs. And from my understanding, the clerks are still kind of doing something to call in the neighborhood. In the neighborhood. Out to, yes. uh, the community. I, I think that's very important because judges are very important. And you know, you used an example before about the drug court program where the county judges back in 1998 voted against the drug court program. And you know, there has to be some time, there has to be some accountability and they have to be in tune to the community. And I firmly believe that, you know, the day of you know law and order, lock them up, throw the key, you know, it's a thing of the past. Uh, should there be some people in jail? Absolutely. I mean, some folks out there, you know, should be under the jail, but it shouldn't drive our system. I mean, you should have a more uh, compassionate system where if it's non-violent then offenders, it's not necessary, they go into prison. Because what happens, and we talked about it earlier, that if you go to prison, normally it means that you didn't finish your high school education. Uh, number two, you're not employed. And once you get out, you have three strikes against you. And you know, we say you go to jail and you pay your, set, pay your debt to society, but it doesn't happen that way. So uh, we have a lot of work to do in the criminal justice system, but I still think it's the best system that we have going. Well, and hopefully it will get better with regard to rehabilitation efforts and also um, the, the, the programs to help people get their education while they're in jail or while they're on probation. Um, tell me about how Get On Track got started and your involvement with it. Well, I think it was one of the most important programs that we started at the court. I think uh, it was Judge Groves along with yourself uh, came to us and we highlighted the fact about, you know, the lack of education and the folks who we see come fr in front of us. Uh, most of the time they're not employed. And, and the other third part was the drug and alcohol. So uh, you guys came up with a program where really focus upon the education component. You know, a person will enter a program, uh, had to get a GED uh, to get out the program. 
But again, it focused on the whole component of education. Without education, you cannot be gainfully employed. Without education, you can not, cannot start seeing the effects of drugs and alcohol in your life. And I thought it was an outstanding program, and uh, by my understanding, it's still going forward today at, at the court. I, I put somebody on probation today, put them on, get on track, told them they had to get their GED. If they didn't get their GED in so much time, they could bring their toothbrush back when they came to see me. So they weren't happy about that, but they need the education. Yeah. Education is critical. Yeah. You know, I think my days have, as a Cleveland Municipal Court, I can remember there's a direct correlation with individuals who not have education and the process of being involved in the criminal justice system. And I think it still stands yeah, today. They, they, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, what do you think are some of the most challenging issues the court is looking at today from both your perspective as a municipal court judge and an appeals court judge? Okay. Well, I guess I'd like to maybe turn that around a little bit. You know, I'm hoping in the years to come that judges will become more uh, progress progressive and proactive and be more in tune to what's happening in our communities, in our neighborhoods. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about the drug court program. We talked a little bit about uh, re rehab. And now we have a lot of reentry courts. And that was unheard of, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And basically what reentry court does is try to help prepare a person once he or she gets out of prison to come back in our mainstream. So, you know, I think if we have a responsibility if we incarcerate folks when they get out of our prisons and our penal institutions to integrate, reintegrate them into our community. And other than that, I think judges, we have to be at the forefront. You know, we are a very important co issue branch of, of the government. So I would like to see the judges to really sometimes operate outside of the box and say, what can I do as a judge to help our community? And that's important, operating outside of the box. Well, thank you for being here today. I really, really enjoyed talking judge. to you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Cleveland Honors. And remember, former Supreme Court Justice William Douglas once said, common sense often makes a good law. So long to everyone. Mm -hmm.